And off we go for free and low-cost technology tools for legal aid. I'll just give you very quickly. I'm an ideal wear expert trainer. I'm also faculty for, for N10, if you're familiar with that organization. And as Sarge mentioned, I normally am found doing cybersecurity stuff, but I also do a lot of tactical tech training, strategic tech planning, that kind of thing. And I'm here today to talk about all sorts of tools, and I love experimenting with new tools and low-cost tools and free tools and, and very have very strong opinions about many of them, and I'll try to restrain those a bit for you guys. And Ken, I'll let you tell a little bit about yourself. Well, I really am excited about today's uh, um, webinar. It's really great to partner with Josh. We've been able to do this in the past, and it's always uh, technology hijinks. I'm the technology director <laughs> at Advancing Justice Los Angeles. Uh, we're a very unique uh, civil rights and legal services organization located in, take a guess, Los Angeles. And uh, I'm also National Vice President of the National Lawyers Guild. I've been doing uh, nonprofit technology for about 20 years now and ready to rock and roll. Cool. And I should have mentioned, yeah, I work for Roundtable Technology and in my role as Vice President there, I help hundreds of nonprofit organizations over my career. It's been thousands of nonprofit organizations with various technology challenges. And so that's uh, how, I, how I come to you. And Idealware, of course, your nonprofit technology resource created the content for this webinar and provides all sorts of resources and training materials to help nonprofits learn and make smart decisions about technology. And hopefully you're already familiar with them. What we're going to talk about today, true cost of free, you know, free as in cats, free as in beer, infrastructure, productivity and data management program support, basically the different tools across the different program areas. Uh, a term that is sometimes used, if Ken or I refer to it today, as your tech stack, which is what are the kind of core suite of applications you use to do things like email and calendar and communicate and, and capture data and report on data and make phone calls and provide webinars. It is kind of ridiculous. I've started doing with, as part of onboarding, when we take on new clients, we have a little template that we use to create essentially the tech stack for organizations and even smallish, you know, 10 person organizations, when we break it out, they may have as many as 40 or 50 different applications that they're using to manage all of the different things that they do. And that doesn't even take into account what we refer to as like all the shadow IT, because I'm sure many of you out there know, you probably installed one or two or 10 or 100 of your own apps or applications to solve some problem at work. And that has become, whether anybody else but you knows it or not, part of that organization's technology stack. So we're going to talk about all that stuff. Ken, do you have anything you want to add in there before I Yeah, start I on? want to add and kind of recognize for a lot of folks, one of the challenges of the conversation we'll be having today when we talk about infrastructure is that we all know in the field that this is an area that isn't funded. So I think, first of all, give yourselves a pat on the back if there's electricity and internet and, and services that make um, the mission-driven work you do flow a little bit more smoothly. And within that, I think as we start to go through these, these, um, these pieces, to kind of rethink of how they all fit together because infrastructure, like Joshua said, is really the backbone um, or the central nervous system of the work that we do. So let's try to keep that in mind as, as we go through today's slides. Absolutely. All right, you don't have a lot to spend, so why wouldn't you get a powerful solution that's free? And essentially, why wouldn't you use free solutions? And people, are, by the way, by all means, enter stuff into the questions if you have comments on, on any of this. But the first reason, and I think the easiest example that I, that I usually pull for this is Salesforce. Uh, most folks know that Salesforce is, I'm gonna, you know, with free as in puppies, uh, for the first 10 users and for up to a certain set of records. And that's a pretty phenomenal donation by Salesforce for an incredibly powerful CRM or constituent relationship management platform. But the big giant but that, that leaps out there is getting onto Salesforce and using it effectively requires quite a bit of effort and often expertise that you'll generally have to hire or invest to train in your staff. So there's a massive upfront investment and ongoing investment to use that quote unquote free technology. Other things like G Suite 
or Office 365 or other kinds of donations can be a little bit more free, you know, as in beer, in that you just get to get it and start using it. But even those, as you increase your complexity of using them, will take up more and more time. And that total cost of ownership or TCO for a product is something that you do not want to overlook or ignore when you're making decisions about what platform you want to be on. Because it might be free to go on Salesforce, but whereas something like Donor Perfect, you know, is going to cost a few hundred dollars a month or a few thousand dollars a year for licenses, but that money you're going to spend on Donor Perfect may actually be a lot less than the time and resources you're going to have to invest in using Salesforce. So those are all things to kind of think about uh, around the free. Ken, do you want to chime in on anything there? Yeah, I think for me, one of the important aspects that that, that raised Joshua was thinking about um, also making sure that you loop in your senior management team and the finance folks, because as we're seeing a transformation in technology where infrastructure is really becoming an as a service. So instead of being a capital expenditure of let me get $5,000, spend it one time, 10,000, we're done. It's rapidly becoming a monthly recurring cost. So, so also figuring out what the cost of the puppy is going to be as well. Yeah. And that jabs right into our next slide, which is, you know, you want to think about the entire cost. So what's the upfront, the purchase cost of the solution you're thinking about? What's the implementation cost? What's the cost to get it rolling? And then what's the long-term support cost? So if we go back to the Salesforce example, you know, just to throw out some random numbers, you know, if I was a 10-person organization, it might be free, quote unquote, to use Salesforce, but it might cost me, I'm not joking, $50,000 to implement Salesforce for my organization. And then the long-term support of working with a Salesforce person over time, it might be something like 10 grand or 20 grand a year to help run, you know, administer our Salesforce database. And other services are generally, you know, going to be less than that, but some, you know, may, may cost all that. And as Ken mentioned, you know, the days of we're going to spend, and, and this was never true, but people kind of thought it was true, but the days where we're going to spend $10,000 on a server and then not spend any more money for the next 10 years until we have to buy a new server for $10,000 are, are long gone. Now it's, now you're paying for infrastructure on an ongoing basis. And I would argue this is actually a lot better, but many nonprofits who were operating on a, we're going to spend as little as possible on infrastructure are finding that when they abandon this, this, traditional infrastructure and move into infrastructure as a service that these ongoing monthly costs are a bit shocking to them. So that's something if you're, you know, haven't done that yet, you, know, you might want to brace yourself for. All right, so let's go through some of the tools here. We're going to start talking about infrastructure tools first and some of the kind of basic things that you need to run on. And one point, and the, the link here, by the way, that, that you'll be able to share in the deck is to an article of kind of 10 reasons. It's from uh, Tech Networks of Boston, and it's 10 reasons why being proactive is better than being reactive around technology. And I can use just, and I've, I've used this example a lot. If you take just a, you know, laptop computer that a typical person like Ken is using, and I'm going to be really conservative here and say Ken, you know, earns fifty thousand dollars a year in his job at, at, at you know, uh, in Los Angeles. And if that's the case, and that we take him as like an average staff person there, then we're essentially paying twenty five dollars an hour for 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 Ken's work if you break that over the course of the year. If he's got a seven year old, you know, barely functional computer that's delaying his ability to, to work on an ongoing basis um, and he can't work reliably if he's losing even you know something like 15 minutes a day right then the cost of buying him a nice 1500 dollars macbook is going to be positive return on investment uh, for the organization within the year and then you're going to keep that work you know that that workstation for another you know three or four or five years after that so it, while it's very hard for organizations often to find the funds to get all of the infrastructure that they need so that their staff can work reliably, uh, it is almost one of the best investments you can make. <laughs> 
because that doesn't even take into account the productivity loss we get from Ken, you know, from him being frustrated by his computer, from him losing a document that he's been working on for four hours because his computer crashed, he had to reboot in the middle of the day, not being able to make phone calls, leaving the organization because he's so frustrated at the technology that's sitting at his desk that, you know, he's just like, I'll just go take another job. Those are massive costs to the organizations. And I see this over and over and over again where organizations, you know, resist investing in infrastructure because they feel like they can't afford it. It's you know, tough to have fundraising. So make sure that your staff have the basics. They have a computer that works, that they can boot up, that turns on, that works reliably. They have internet. They have, if, if voice is a critical function, they have voice. And that the services that people use just at a basic level are incredibly easy to, to use, are very reliable, work fast, all those things. Ken, is there anything you want to other than the salary I gave you, it's really you want to disagree with there. <laughs> you nailed all the right all the right points. I think the only thing that I would offer is that the the example of phone is just so on point, Joshua, because we kind of take it for granted. There is always going to be phone. Where my preference would be, oh, does the staff person have a computer? Has to take the same level of priority of can the person get dial tone, especially now when we see, or at least I'm seeing in, in work that I do outside of the organization, a substantially reduced reliance on something like phone, and yet there's always a guarantee that there's going to be dial tone. There isn't the guarantee that there's going to be an adequate computer or adequate bandwidth. So, so yeah, how do we shift that to kind of say, infrastructure is a priority and infrastructure includes computers the same way that it includes dial tone on a phone. Yep. And, and just to throw out another thing, and this gets into like cloud infrastructure, I won't get too deep into it now, but, you know, I described something that's kind of like, you know, cloud, you know, nirvana or, you know, being a completely digital organization, whatever you want to call it. But the, I, the idea that on some level, most organizations, you know, want to be striving for is that all of your staff can do all of the functions that they need to do for your organization from any internet connected device that they have no matter where they are. So if I have a device and I'm connected to the internet, I can, with as long as I have the appropriate permissions and security, you know, credentials, taxes, I can basically do everything. So I can, you know, make a phone call, you know, from my personal mobile phone as, as if I'm calling from the office, right? It, it's, it's a, you know, unified voice system that I'm, that I'm using for my mobile phone that, you know, things like dial pad, ring central, these kinds of functions. I can log into my email on Gmail or on Office 365. I can log into our database via Salesforce or Donut Perfect. I can, you know, do all the things I need to do regardless of where I am and regardless of what kind of device I'm on as long as I have a good internet. That's a decent thing to try to achieve, you know, not tomorrow, but over time. All right, we're going we're gonna to continue moving on. Uh, going back to the, the basic PCs and networking equipment, you know, if it's a hardware problem, there's lots of resources. You can look through them here. Many of these you probably know. A few of them you don't know. And, of course, you can, you know, attempt to, to raise money through grants. And, of course, you can always just, just find the money and go buy it. And if you're looking, again, for justification, you know, you feel free to use that $25 an hour, you know, item that I talked about to, to try to you know, go to your CFO or go to your fundraisers or your know, development people and, and, and really make the point that we need to have uh, appropriate infrastructure for, for our folks. Some common productivity apps that kind of, you know, as we start at the base of the tech stack, so to speak, again, that, that stack of what are all the services that you use to do the work of your organization. So, I'm guessing almost everybody on the webinar has heard of the big two here, which are G Suite and Microsoft Office 365. These comprise a list of the core Office applications, which would be like email, calendars, contacts. So that's Gmail and Google Calendars and Google Contacts on the G Suite side, and that's Outlook on the Microsoft side. And then you've also got the word processing, spreadsheets, slide presentations, or PowerPoints. Uh, that is the Google Drive or Google Apps on the on the G Suite side, and then is you know Microsoft Word, Microsoft Excel, Microsoft PowerPoint on the Microsoft side. And then there's some open source options if that's the route that you like to go. Apache OpenOffice and LibreOffice are are two, but these are the kind of core things that pretty much every organization needs on some level and 
for the most part, I think we all take for granted that we have this now. And there's some other plays that come in here that we'll, that we'll talk about. Um, Ken, is there anything you want to throw in on this? Or? Yeah, I, I think that it's important to throw in the distinction that between, uh, by G Suite, we're talking about um, the donated product for nonprofits and um, similar with Office 365, and we're not talking about the free product like Gmail, et cetera. Um, because I think one of the important things, and since we're talking about infrastructure, is how do we make sure that we have audit capacity, we can control users, et cetera, which is probably one of the foundational pieces of infrastructure, is making sure we have control of users, which through G Suite and Office 365. The other thing that I would add as well is, like, like you said, Joshua, just we are gradually moving or have really moved to a cloud first environment with Office 365 being on the um, leading edge of where Microsoft is deploying features and updates. Um, the old school product, which a lot of um, legal shops are still stuck in, um, are kind of trailing in terms of the update cycles, et cetera. Yep. And now it's, and, and yeah, if you're still running, you know, Microsoft Word 2007, you know, or even 2010, you know, 2010 may not sound that that's you know now an eight year old product and and I believe is is being end of life as it happened already by Microsoft reasonably soon um, and even you know something like Office 2013 uh, you lose a lot of functionality in terms of being able to work with Office 365 on that platform and when you move to these cloud services then the updates to those pieces of software are part of the core suite so that that's a huge advantage for you. All right. We're going to talk a little bit about cloud file sharing. There's there's some that aren't in here, but effectively one of the things is where are you going to keep all the documents that your staff are working on? And the traditional way to handle this is have a file server or multiple servers in an office and you have like an F drive or an N drive that you know is shared out or multiple drives and people you know access those uh, through the office. But more and more people are moving to cloud-based file sharing. With G Suite, that typically becomes Google Drive. That's usually the default platform that, that people will use. For organizations that are on Office 365, there's a few different options. Uh, OneDrive is sort of the, the product in the space which pairs with SharePoint that Microsoft provides as part of Office 365, but a lot of organizations find that very complex and difficult to use, and the OneDrive functionality is, is not typically considered as mature as the two platforms that I'm going to talk about next, which are box.org, and then I will also add to this dropbox.com. And the, these are platforms, Dropbox unfortunately does not have a very generous charity program, so they basically will 30% discount you uh, off of what you'll see as their retail pricing for teams or enterprise. Box.org, however, does have a donation program that's a bit similar to Salesforce. I believe it's the first 10 users are free up to a certain amount of storage, and then after that, uh, you start having to pay for licenses. But both Box and Dropbox, are, I would say, a bit more mature as products and, and things that I would be more comfortable recommending to most organizations than I would OneDrive. And again, if you're an organization that's on G Suite using you know, Gmail for, for your email and Google calendars and such, then Google Drive uh, is an excellent uh, file sharing platform. And I want to just very quickly dispel a, a very common myth which is that if you're on Google Drive, you can't use Microsoft Office documents. That is not true. Uh, you can store a Microsoft Word document or a PDF file or a movie file or a Excel spreadsheet in Google Drive without having to convert it to the Google Drive or you know, Google Sheets if there's an Excel document format. Um, and as long as you have a licensed copy of Microsoft Excel on the computer you're using, you can go ahead and open that up at Google Drive, edit it in Microsoft Excel, save it back to Google Drive, and that all works just fine. Uh, so just want to mention that because a lot of people don't understand that, that you don't have to give up everything Microsoft Office if you're on Google Drive. Ken, anything to, to add there yeah. or disagree with? Yeah, this is one of the reasons why I think that it's important for folks before pulling the trigger on a tool to have some type of um, strategy as to what tool or, or what need the tool meets. And so for me, if someone is on an O365 shop or a G Suite shop, 
I'm a big fan of, okay, use the file sharing tools for internal. And I really like Box for the external sharing because Box has a lot of, um, I like to call it, and I, sorry that it's so mean to Dropbox, but I like to call Box Dropbox for business because Box will actually, um, <laughs> they're able to provide you what's called a business associates agreement if you need one. And usually that applies to folks who are doing um, um, stuff like HIPAA work, where um, my understanding is that Dropbox is not at the point yet where they can um, provide you a BAA. Um, yeah, but both are really good options. Pause for the strategy as to what is internal sharing look like, how do we control it, and also external sharing. Yeah, all good stuff, Ken, thank you. And and yeah, if, if, if this isn't something you've done yet, it's it's generally pretty easy to like take your email if you're you know if any of you out there are still on an email server you know hosting Exchange or something and, and I hope there's not too many of you out there moving that to a cloud platform is typically a not a, a huge undertaking and is and is and is relatively easy to manage moving your file sharing out to a cloud is a bit more of a change in terms of training in terms of the the migration project and things like that but it also provides you know potentially really massive benefits in terms of your improved ability to collaborate uh, both internally and externally and, and lots of other good things uh, which takes us to backups and this is a uh, you know a, a big concern for lots of folks you want to make sure you're, you have your data backed up and crash plan is if you have traditional data on workstations or servers that you wish to make sure it's backed up. Crash plan will let you back up uh, an unlimited amount of data from a single workstation or server for $10 a month on their small business plan. And if that's something you need to do and you're just trying to do that in the most low cost way, uh, that's really important. This is a, a very useful tool for you. I also wanna point out, that just to very quickly, I'm doing a business continuity and disaster recovery workshop next week here in New York City. It's just a bit top of mind for me. But to understand that there's a real difference between backup and continuity, just so that everybody understands. If I have my data backed up in, in you know, crash plan or any other service, that is not the same as, as having what's referred to as high availability or sometimes continuity. Meaning if, if I lose my data, if I get ransomware or my hard drive dies, it's not like that data is instantly available to me and I can continue working without interruption. I have to go through a restore process that may, depending on the platform, depending on the amount of data I have, may take hours or even days to go through. If you need continuity or high availability, that's a different thing. Crash Plan's not going to provide that for you. Uh, so it's important to understand the distinction between those two things. If you have a lot of data, and you want an even less expensive than Amazon Glacier, which charges four tenths of one cent per gigabyte of data to back up, which is obviously quite inexpensive, that's per month, then you can use that. But it's something where you, the recovery of that data, is something that's fairly time consuming. So it's not a place where you can back up data that you might need in a hurry. Uh, and also you can't back up a massive amount of data to it very quickly. So if you have a huge data archive that you're okay if it takes a few months to get it backed up, and you're okay if it took a few days to restore data from it, then and, and you just want to keep the cost as low as possible, but but have it backed up and archived somewhere, Amazon Glacier might be something that you could look at. Ken, do you have anything you want to add on that? Yeah, those are really here? good choices. Yeah, those are good choices. I would only add um, Backblaze to the mix, um, and I've sent okay. a link to the organizer so they can share that out. Fantastic, thank you. And the, the other thing which we didn't talk about a lot in here, and I get this question all the time, is what about those cloud services? So what about you know Gmail? What about the data that's in Google Drive? What about the stuff that's in Office 365 or in Dropbox or in Box.org? And all of those do have retention that's part of the, the plan that you're already in. It's, assuming that you're in the nonprofit donation programs of those and you're or a paid version of it, and you're not just on the, the free, you know, kind of consumer side. And usually it's, the minimum is gonna be like 30 days of retention for most of the kinds of stuff, which means if I delete something today, and 20 days from now, I realize that I need that back, I'll be able to recover it through the native retention that they have. But a lot of them don't have retention beyond that, and sometimes they don't really, it's not as user-friendly or as granular, meaning it's, you, you might not be able to pull one message, I might have to recover the whole mailbox, you know, or, or the entire, you know, folder structure or something like that. And if you have 
more robust res restoration needs and you know that, then you would want to look into additional services. And there's a bunch of those out there and we can provide links. Uh, SART, if you're not, you know, spanning is, is one. Backupify is another. And I believe that Backblaze also does have some cloud uh, backup solutions. Do you know offhand, Ken, if Backblaze also has some cloud? Yeah, I think that I they do. What also comes to mind yeah. is uh, there's a network attached storage device company called Synology, and they actually have mm -hmm. a um, Office 365 and um, G Suite um, backup tool there as well. So oh, very cool. Okay. For that locally. Hey, so uh, we put All a right. link to uh, Backblaze in the chat. Also, if any of the audience members have any tools that they want to share, put those into the questions, and then we can share that out with the entire audience. And if anyone has questions along the way, let me know. And sorry, just a quick note, I'm not seeing questions come in. If there aren't any questions, that's okay. It might be that my settings aren't, aren't seeing them, so just know that I'm not seeing questions. Okay. Yeah, we, we have not had any since the response over where someone was from. So it's... Uh, gotcha, you know, okay, excellent. Yep. All right, so people are either not listening or, or we're just answering everything for them, Ken. Either way, we're, we're <laughs> no big All right, uh, on antivirus and, and on security, uh, antivirus is, is still something that you will want to have as part of your core infrastructure for your workstations. Avast has a free tool. I do recommend pretty strongly that people go with a kind of managed uh, security solution. There's, unfortunately, this is becoming a massive space because of the amount of ransomware noise that the people are, are hearing about. They're an antivirus. I just want to be 100% clear here is one tool uh, in the toolbox of preventing, you know, against the kinds of attacks that you'll see. If we look at something like ransomware, the backups that we just talked about are going to be a very important tool in the toolbox because if you do get data ransom, you know, encrypted and, and then someone wants to ransom, if you can easily restore that data from something like Backblaze or CrashPlan, that's, that's great. Of course, you'd love to not get encrypted and ransomed in the first place, and antivirus may, may sometimes help with that, but the other things that will really help with that are making sure your systems are patched so they're getting updated on a regular basis. Um, one, and I'll, I'll add this for, for SARS as well, a tool that if you don't have a patch management solution uh, that, that you know, one that I have found that works really well for non-technical folks is called Automox. And I will throw that chat in there. And that is a, a really nice patch management solution. Patch management is basically keeping your systems updated with software updates that are released by the vendors of those products. So if you have a Microsoft laptop running Windows 10, there are updates that are released for Windows 10 that patch up security holes that the bad guys exploit to get malware onto your computers. So antivirus is one thing you can do, patch management is another. Perhaps the most important and easiest thing for you to do is to provide what's called security awareness training to your staff to inform them about how social engineering and phishing attacks and things like that work. And that is also an incredibly important piece of securing your organization. So I just want to very quick add, uh, this is, isn't a cybersecurity webinar, so I won't spend more time on that, but wanted to make that point. Ken, do you, anything you want to chime in on there? Yeah, I, I think that for me, the, the last piece is the most important piece, is how you can't really build for security unless you're building for infrastructure. And part of this conversation is how do we make sure that from the firewall level to the desktop level, which is where um, Avast and other endpoint products are, um, kind of fit this whole fabric of, of infrastructure, which builds towards security. I would add that, let's say, F-Secure um, and Komodo One, are building um, patch management tools into their endpoint protection products. Um, and so thinking there's been this wonderful evolution of endpoint protection, which used to be called only antivirus, where a lot of these um, tools are now looking for suspicious behavior and other activity to help um, your computing experience be safer. So make sure that you have something. Um, even Windows Defender is actually pretty good at this point in time. Yep. Awesome. All right. All right, and we're on to the next topic, and I'm going to pick up the pace just a little bit because I think we're running just slightly slow. So I'm going to – actually, no, we're not too bad. All right, productivity and data management. So we're on to another kind of set of tools. Here's a really nice tool that is free for kind of basic use and pretty inexpensive if you want to go. Toggle for time tracking. It integrates lovely with Gmail and, and 
Outlook or Office 365 and provides time tracking for your staff and, you know, what they're doing and, you know, allows you to log time against cases for legal services or log time against work for administrative workers. And it's, you know, a nice little kind of plugin. You just sort of tap it and tell it what you're working on and then the timer starts. And then when you switch tasks, you tap it and it starts tipping. And a weird sort of thing happens, by the way, on a productivity side, because this is title productivity. When you start tracking time and have people do that, uh, you can actually, you know, without even trying to increase the focus that people have, because when they know they're sort of logging time against a particular task, they will generally not task switch as much because it's a pain in the butt to stop their timer, switch to some other thing, start the timer for that, and then switch back again. So it actually can improve the kind of focused work of the organization. It's a whole different webinar on, on productivity and things like that. Uh, Ken, anything on, on that one? No, nothing. That's good. Okay. To-do list management, there's an app called Todoist, which again is free for basic use and then a fairly small fee if you want to, you know, get, and this integrates again with Gmail and Outlook really well and is just a kind of, you know, task list on steroids that allows you to do a lot more categorization and prioritization. And if that's something that you're, you know, challenged with in your organization, you want a bet, you know, Outlook has a pretty decent task list and in Outlook 2016, it's gotten quite a bit better in terms of the functionality it allows you. Gmails is pretty much god awful uh, and, and hasn't gotten much better. They, they sort of created Google Keep, which and as far as I know, no one likes as well. Uh, so Todoist is, is a much better kind of task manager for just basic to-do list functionality if that's something that you're looking for. Meeting scheduling, and this is a, a huge pain point for, for so many folks, and there's actually a tool, the tool that I like best uh, for or just my own calendar management and scheduling uh, isn't listed here, but I will I will throw the link in for folks. Doodle, I feel like we're ahead. I'm actually going to skip ahead to the next slide, and we're going to come back to Doodle. Uh, oops, where where we get? I don't know. It's too far ahead. Okay. So Doodle is for meeting scheduling when I have a bunch of people. So let's say me and Sart and Ken and Jane all need to have a meeting together and we're all from four different organizations and we don't want to have 9,000 emails back and forth, then when I'm trying to organize that meeting, I can set up what's called a doodle poll where I'll create maybe 10 time slots that work for me for the meeting and I will email Ken and Jane and Sart that a poll that says, here's the 10 times that work for me and then each of them fill in the times that work for them and as each person fills out the poll, they can see the times that other people have said work and don't work. And hopefully without too much back and forth, the four of us or five of us or six of us or sometimes even 10 of us can find a meeting time that works for everybody. And that's a huge pain point in a lot of organizations, a lot of people trying to schedule meetings. And Doodle is still the best tool that I know of to schedule these kind of group meetings. If anyone has a better one, I'm, I'm all ears, but uh, that's the best one that I know. And we're gonna talk about doing your own meetings later with uh, You Can Book Me in, in Calendly. Uh, if this, then that, or if ta 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 uh, uh, however you want to pronounce that. And another very popular tool in this space is called Zapier. And with if ta, ta, ta you create what are called recipes. With Zapier, you create what are called zaps. And uh, I don't know, Ken, I don't know, if, I, I actually, well, I'll tell you one, one way that I use this. So we um, want to make sure that if someone um, comes to our website and, and downloads one of our resources, um, we gate that with, you know, an email. And of course, we then want to see if they would you know, like to subscribe to, to any of our other communications. So the way that we can do that is we can create a Zap or an if, an if this then that recipe that basically is triggered when an email gets entered onto our website for, for any of our gated content. It hands over to our mail platform, which in our case is Aweber, and then produces an opt-in message for that person saying, hey, you downloaded this resource. If you'd like to, you know, get our monthly newsletter and learn about more resources we have, just, you know, please click to subscribe and, and, and then that's go. So that's triggered all automatically 
through this recipe, right? And, and some people may not have to do that because you already have it integrated with your website. And there's virtually an infinite number of kinds of things that you can do to relate to Dropbox to, to, you know, so I can have it, you know, when an email comes into this particular inbox, please create a new row in this particular spreadsheet, you know, with the email address and the date it came in and the subject line, you know, as separate uh, values in each column, right? There's all sorts of things that you can do with, uh, with these tools to automate um, different functions across your organization and between different applications or, or services. Ken, anything on that? Yeah. Any I, I favorite think, recipes or zaps that, that you want to share? Yeah, so for some of our hotlines that we have using um, Twilio, we actually have a zap that um, puts those text messages into a spreadsheet so that the line supervisor, without having to go into the Twilio dashboard, has an at a glance, what are the types of messages and what lines are those messages hitting? Because uh, we have seven um, different language lines. Um, but I think the core concept here is, um, particularly um, at a meta level, is how do we move away from email to lubricate this work? And, and I think part of this is also the concept of how can we be intelligently lazy? Um, and I think Zapier and If This and That completely fit that bill, that if you take a moment to pause and use either one of those tools to identify what are the processes that I can automate and hopefully that I can automate so I don't have to receive verbose emails notifications, then suddenly life is so much better with less email. And I, I would just like to point out that this tool is extremely easy to use. You can do very complicated things that it took understanding a scripting and programming language to do years ago, and with a few clicks, do it automatically. You don't need to know how to program to use it. it it's a great, simple tool, even though we're talking about doing some complex stuff. It's very easy to learn to use and put together some really good time savers. Yep, and, and if people are looking for guidelines, like, you know, anytime you find yourself or one of your colleagues you know, doing manual work that seems repetitive. So anytime you find yourself doing data entry or taking information from one place and, you know, exporting it and importing it to another place uh, and just, just basically taking information and moving that same information to somewhere else, those are opportunities to automate that you want to ruthlessly um, automate wherever you can. And, and these tools allow you to do that. And as Sart so eloquently said, these do not require programming. These, anyone who can use email can use these tools. They are, it, this particular image may look a bit complicated. I swear to you that these things are, are not complicated and are, are very, very user friendly. Another free tool that's out there is Google Voice, which is a free voice over IP service you can get from Google. Uh, this is something I actually use in my personal life. So many, many years ago, I ported my personal mobile phone number over to Google Voice. Uh, just as a quick take, what that allows me to do is when I move to different phone providers, so if I decide I'm just gonna switch from Verizon to T-Mobile, uh, the phone number that everybody has for me doesn't change. It's just still that Google Voice number, and I just redirect that Google Voice number that doesn't change to whatever my new phone number is. And I can redirect it, in fact, to multiple phone numbers. And when I call people, I make sure they see my Google Voice number. And so a lot of times I don't even know what my actual mobile phone number is because I just know what my Google Voice number is. And when people ask me or if I need my actual mobile number, I actually have to go look it up. Um, it's not something that works great for an entire organization, but it can serve a lot of interesting use cases. One way that we've used it at Roundtable, just as a quick example, is two-factor authentication on a you know, security side is something that's really important. And of course, we have all of these administrative credentials for all these different organizations, but if we put two-factor authentication on it, now it's tied to a particular phone or a particular authenticator app that's on a particular device that's very hard to, to scale across maybe 10 or 20 different people who might need that. So we've created a few different Google Voice accounts that we use where we can have these text messages for second factor authentication sent for our team. And, and that's been like one solution that I can, I can throw out there. I don't know, Ken, if you have any other for Google Voice, but it's a, it's a pretty handy, like free voice. You can set up a phone number, make calls from your computer, receive calls to your computer, use it on any mobile phone, on any computer, and you just have a phone number that works.
Yeah, I really like the use case scenario that you're using for um, two-factor, especially since uh, um, using an app across multiple people is really difficult. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. The thing that I would throw out here is yeah. a suggestion. Got to get them all to scan that scan code at the same time. It's really hard. Sorry, it's very dirty. dirty. <laughs> <Right. laughs> <Good. laughs> we what tried it. Yeah, it doesn't but, work uh, well. <laughs> that interface between this slide and the next slide is something like Dialpad. I'm a big fan of Dialpad, especially if you're using G Suite as your primary messaging platform. Dialpad has really smooth integrations into G Suite. The nice thing about Dialpad is that you're getting this functionality as well as you have access to Uber Conference, which is a good alternative to freeconferencecall.com. Um, that's become an issue because um, with freeconferencecall.com, a lot of folks are um, starting to opt out of, I don't want to pay, if I'm calling on a mobile phone, they will charge you like a cent, I don't know, is it a cent a minute or a cent an hour? But there's a there's a chargeback that folks experience and some people are just like, no, no thanks, I'm, I'm cool with that, I don't want to be on that. So an alternative to free conference call would be Uber Conference. Um, but the integration between Dialpad and Uber Conference and G Suite is just amazingly smooth. And I'll put a second, um, we actually use Dialpad at Roundtable, and one of the things I do is in, implement voice over IP platforms. I've also done Ring Central. I've also done 8x8, I've also done Grasshopper. There's, there's a lot of these platforms out there. They're sometimes referred to as unified communications because they also have messaging, sometimes video conferencing built into them as well. Uh, Zoom is actually moving a bit into the space. You can now get phone numbers with Zoom and that can be your kind of video and voice platform. And one of the really important pieces when we talked before about kind of moving fully to the cloud is Dialpad's actual tagline is called killing the desk phone. And when we implement it for organizations, which we've done quite a bit, we recommend that they don't use traditional desk phones because you give up a lot of the, the functionality that is pretty cool. Uh, another thing, I don't know, Ken, if you've noticed this, and it's a little bit creepy, Dialpad recently introduced something called Voice AI which for legal services is actually super interesting because it takes a transcript, an automated artificial intelligence transcript of every conversation you have through Dialpad and actually identifies the different speakers through different colors in the transcript. And you can, in the middle of the call, say action item, and it separates out the next 10 seconds as a task that goes into the notes. You can create notes that are tagged to the particular time in the transcript. And all that's just native in their what's called voice AI uh, solutions. There's a lot of, um, and they have other stuff there where, you know, if you want to start collecting data on how you're, let's say you're, you're handling a phone bank for providing legal services over the phone and you want to, you know, almost like a call center, they can actually do things like gauging the sentiment of the person who your, you know, representative is talking to. And if they're angry, you know, a supervisor can get a notification can join the call, can listen in on the call, can potentially provide guidance to the legal services representative who's handling that call. There's all sorts of interesting capabilities when you move this stuff into the digital world. And although freeconference.call is here, you see Uber Conference is listed. I could not recommend Uber Conference more highly to folks. The free version is fine. The paid version is 10 bucks a month and allows you to not have a pin and a few other functions. And it is, spectacularly easy to use and just a phenomenal service. So can't recommend it enough. And yeah, it comes, comes with Dialpad as well. All right. On to project management, which is a huge pain point for many organizations. And I would say that like we're, we're probably at the phase with project management where I'd say a lot of IT organizations or a lot of IT support were with ticketing probably like 10 years ago where, and here's what I mean, by uh, 10 years ago, it seemed like there, a lot of the consulting I was doing with organizations, I, you'd have like a staff of maybe 10 and two other IT people at an organization serving maybe 100 or 150 staff, and they were trying to do that without a ticketing system to manage support requests. And, and the first thing I would do when I would work is, okay, you need a ticketing, so you kind of can't do this without a way to track the tickets that are coming in. Now I think everybody gets that, and everybody, you know, up, once they get past like 10 or 20 staff, they're, they're using ticketing systems. But I still see a lot of organizations that are doing, you know, 20, 30 different projects a year, and are basically managing that through spreadsheets and email, 
and it's working about as well as trying to handle tickets through spreadsheets and email. So project management is kind of the, the Uber skill. And I think, Sart, you mentioned that the next training is, is on project management, if I heard that correctly. And I would strongly recommend that people look into that. That's uh, for, for N10, that's, that's what I teach as part of their faculty is around project management. So I, I will try not to get too up on the high horse here. But if you're doing projects on a regular basis, a project management tool, which are cheap and are incredibly easy to use, is an absolute essential. Trello is a great one. We use Asana around table, which Asana after Calendly would be the number one tool, but it, I started using it probably three years ago, so I can't say in last year. Asana, I could not function without it. There's just no question. And I, I don't know how much we want to get into this, but you'll see that, that this, which is Trello, most of them will allow you to organize things through what's referred to as a, a Kanban board, or if you want to use the, the sort of uh, bourgeois pronunciation, I think it's referred to as Kanban, I think it's the technically correct appreciation of it but uh and it basically organizes you into these kind of um almost like post-it notes along a wall where you have a column of you know this backlog of all the stuff we're going to do then i have what we're you know what to do this is stuff that's not we're not thinking about doing it we, we definitely know we want to do it but we haven't started it yet then we've got in progress then you know sometimes you might have an in review and then you've got it done and you move things across you know from left to right you put in new tasks as they come up. You can typically put timelines on them. You can assign them to one person as a primary, have secondary or followers for each of those tasks, have a deadline for the task. They typically will integrate with your, if you're on it, you know, cloud-based file sharing system. So I can attach a Google Drive document to it and it's linked to that Google Drive or attach a box.org document and it's linked to that. You can integrate with your calendar so you can see the deadlines of tasks you have in Trello on your Google or on your Outlook calendar, all that good stuff. Asana does that, Trello does that. Um, GQs is a kind of interesting one that, that integrates and basically allows you to turn, for those of you who are project managing out of your Gmail, you can actually turn your Gmail inbox into a Kanban board, <laughs> which I don't recommend. Uh, I did play around with GQs a couple, a couple years ago and it is a super interesting tool, but I recommend actually you know, having email to email and trying to have less of it and then doing project management and something like that's on our trail. But that's me. Uh, Ken, you have anything you want to throw in there? Amen to that. Let email be only email. It's not a knowledge base. <laughs> yeah, it's not, yeah, a, yeah. not the project management tool. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so at Advancing Justice, we're big fans of um, Trello for most of our staff who have not received project management training because like Joshua, like, right on point of course like you named it it's we use the the analog or the metaphor of hey it's like having um a bunch of sticky notes um that you can just rearrange and use that as a model to track progress um for the it team since we um try to adhere to project management principles um we use asana but but i think the important thing and the invitation that I'm hearing subtextually from Joshua, and if it's not subtextual, it should be overt, is uh, how do we um, look at our work or refactor our work in a way that we start to factor in project management principles? Because I, I think that's gonna be a huge sea change in uh, the amount of effort we put into work, and it also helps us in terms of learning. So I think at a meta level, how do we move to project management tools within that scope of like, how do we also make sure that all knowledge does not only exist in email boxes? Yep. And in and, and a certain level, you know, you can divide your work into kind of two broad areas. You have your kind of ongoing work and then you have projects that you're working on, which are things that have a kind of beginning, middle and end. And those projects are, for many of us, a huge part of our work. And that's how our organizations progress. It's how we win a grant by putting in a grant application, which is a project. It's how we use a new piece of software, which is a project to select and implement a new piece of software. It's how we make a change to how we manage clients, you know, as they come in, which is a project to manage that change. And the, it, your ability to execute those projects as an organization is absolutely critical to be able to change. And you have to be able to change because uh, in case anyone hasn't realized, the world around us is is changing, and and if we don't so there, change, there's a quick question here. Uh, GQ spelling. GQs. Uh, it's on the slide, so I'll back it up. Um, and it's G Q U E U E S. 
GQs, like a line queue. Okay. Not a pool ball queue. Yeah. Oh, Do you yeah, see okay. it there, uh, Q -U -E. sir? Yeah. Um, I'm still seeing the, the Trello slide currently. Yeah, yeah, it's on the orange there on the Trello oh, slide. Oh, okay, yes. Yes, Hanvan, yes. Flua, Sana, and GQ. Yep, yep. GQ, got it right there. I see it. Excellent. You Thank go. you. Yep, yep. Sorry about that. No problem. Yeah. No problem. Absolutely. All right, Slack. This is the one where you know I'm gonna I'm gonna ruffle some feathers a little bit. So we're we're Slack users at Roundtable, and I implement Slack for many organizations. And I I am not sure honestly what I think about Slack. <laughs> so uh, the what the fans of Slack would say about it, and and I'll I'll speak to that, and I, I do feel this is that it. It reduces the amount of email and the amount of communication that happens in email in organizations. And it allows you to integrate with a lot of different platforms and have improved communication and collaboration across your staff because it gives you a messaging platform that is incredibly feature rich where you get to create channels and people can either follow or unfollow different channels. You can have private channels where you can have communications that are only privy to people that are invited to a private channel. You can create ad hoc groups of people. So if I'm working, you know, Ken and I, Sart and I all work in the same organization and I want to have a quick chat with that just involved the three of us, I create an ad hoc channel of the three of us and that, you know, runs until we're, we're done with that conversation and then it goes away. Really handy, incredibly easy to use, incredibly easy to adopt and definitely reduces the amount of email, definitely improves the ability of staff to communicate with one another. The, the reason I'm, I'm kind of giving you all the uh, hems and haws about it is that there's a part of me that feels like it just moves a lot of communication from email to Slack and perhaps even increases the noise and distractibility that I already think is a major problem in the modern workplace. So I, I will stay off that hobby horse any further than that except to say that it is an incredibly popular tool and and I use it and I happily use it, but I also find that it, it has the flaws in that regard. Kind of a little bit of like a Facebook for work um, in a certain regard. And, and but it does definitely has a ton of advantages. So Ken, I'll, I'll hear if you have any, I don't know if you guys use it advancing uh, justice or not. Uh, well, Art, I don't know. know if you guys use it. Uh, Okay. We don't. We made a we made a um, <laughs> a failure in terms of adopting uh, the cousin of Slack or the competitor of Slack, which was HipChat, maybe uh, three yep. to four years ago. So we were using HipChat, okay. and I think one of the things that we would have done differently is making it clear to staff what type of uh, messages are appropriate for what channel. Um, I think it's just so easy for folks to be like, oh, I want to be in Slack, and other folks are like, I don't really want to touch it or hip chat in our case. And so I feel what yeah. we could have done better was map out um, for staff. These are the types of interactions that are like cool on hip chat. And by the way, some of this other stuff, maybe some of it stays on, um, on email. The other piece with Slack and, and even hip chat that worries me is um, it's so easy to get it wrong, not only in terms of implementation and not providing people kind of um, guidelines or supports, but also in terms of security. It's just too easy to open up a room to the universe. Um, so, so I'm not a big flat Slack fan or hip chat fan as well without like really clear guidelines. Yep. Um, and the, the other thing I'll put here, and this, this is true of a lot of the different tools here, but I'd say Slack is one of the biggest ones, is there's also a kind of generational challenge that, that organizations, I think, deal with on various levels, where you have some people in the organization, you know, I'm, I'm a person who just turned 46 yesterday, so I'm, I'm on the older side of, you know, the workforce at most nonprofits. And as you get people in their 20s coming in, you know, they're people who, for the most part, don't use email and don't think of email as even an application that they, that they want to touch. But they're very used to things like Slack. They're very used to things like Instagram. They're very used to communicating on these other kinds of platforms. So for them to not have it in the workplace, it's kind of like, why don't we have this? So you'll start getting this push from the younger generation coming in because these are the tools that they're used to using. Um, and increasingly, there's a lot of, um, interesting content that you can get to by Slack. There's a lot of, pri you know, kind of channels that you can join where there's groups that have conversations around things like legal services or other things that are on Slack. So it does open you up to the universe of stuff there. But that's a, another point to kind of take in. And that's true of a lot of the tools here that, that we have. 
Um, and then, of course, we talked this about Salesforce before, which, again, is a constituent relationship management system, so tr keeps track of contacts, relationships, activities related to those contacts, contacts groups, organizations, and all the things that constituent relationship management does. And then this giant universe of additional apps have been built around the Salesforce core infrastructure. So there's event management, there's email marketing, there's everything else under the sun that can you can tack on to your Salesforce implementation. And again, it, it is free for up to 10 users and a certain amount of records, um, but implementation can get very expensive, ongoing support can be very expensive, uh, so it's just something you want to take on, you know, understanding what, what might be involved to, to get launched on it. And on to program support, so helping your, your staff, and, and this is where the categories get a little fuzzy for me, but okay, so this is where, we're, this is the slide I was looking for before, this is a tool called You Can Book Me, which I actually used for a long time which you can, is a free tool, so you can use it for free. The other tool that I will recommend, and I'll, I'll put this in the chat right now, is Calendly, um, and I will, let me just add that in. But these are tools that, for me, have been completely life-changing, and it depends on how much you need to schedule appointments with other people, but in legal services, I'm guessing that's something that you, you know, a lot of folks need to do very regularly. I, in my role at Roundtable, you know, need to schedule meetings constantly, and, and an average day for me will have, you know, five, 10 different, you know, 15 to 30 minute or 60 minute meetings. So Calendly, or you can book me, allows you, it integrates with your calendar, and you can set up rules where you can say, here's the different ty types of appointments people can book with me. So if you go to my Calendly page, and I can actually probably share that link if people just want to look at my Calendly page, just for an example. Uh, sorry, I don't know how you feel about that, but, uh, if, if that's okay, I'll go ahead oh, and drop that in. You're welcome to just share that with everybody. They can see what it looks like. So I set up mine, and you can book either a 50-minute meeting or a 30-minute meeting or a 60-minute meeting, and then it gives you a choice of do you want it to be, you know, a Zoom video conference or do you want it to be a, a dial into Uber conference where Uber conference works really well with this. Um, and I even have an option for an in-person meeting, and that in-person meeting is only available for the time slot if I have an hour free on either side of it so that I don't get stuck with a travel commitment that I, that I wouldn't be able to make. And they'll allow you to set up all these rules for different slots and say, you know, if you only want to be able to book after 12 o'clock because you want to keep the morning for heads down work, that's something you can do. If you don't want to have anyone book a meeting with you at 4.30 because you, you know, don't want to be stuck working late, that's something you can do. Uh, if you don't want people to be able to book a meeting back to back, you can set that up. But then once you have that, you can share out this page like I have here, and people can just book meetings with you on your own. And they also have these really cool email plugins where you can create clickable appointment slots for folks. So I can send an email to Ken and say, hey, Ken, here's my Calendly page. You can just go pick a time. But I'll tell you what, here's two that actually work really well for me. And if I always work for you, just click them, and it'll book the appointment, and we'll both get the invite, and we're all set to go. This has been absolutely, you know, changed everything for me in terms of I can't even tell you how many how much time this has saved me over the years. So you can book me fine. I did switch to Calendly. I like their design. You can probably see the design differences if you're looking at the, the Calendly slide. And Ken, I don't know if you have anything you want to share there, if you have another calendaring tool that you want to use, but this is a huge yeah, one for me. These sure are very inexpensive. The, I just, yeah, I just shared uh, the Do Doodle now has a very similar function. But, but right, regardless, okay. it's like, how do we do this scheduling outside of email? To, or how do we do all of this outside seems to be a recurring theme. You got it. Yep. And it's so much better. Um, all right. And there's a kind of interesting tool out there that is not free and it's also not very good, but I did try it for a while in case anyone ever sees it and, and it wants to try it themselves, should not welcome to. But uh, it's called x.ai and they actually have like an artificial bot that you CC on a meeting request. So I email Ken, I CC, you know, Andrew or Amy.ai, and then Andrew, in quotes, the bot, then handles the rest of the communication with Ken. So Andrew can see my calendar. Andrew says, hey, Ken, how does Thursday at noon work? Uh, I tried it for about a week, and it was miserable, so I stopped using it. It may have gotten better. That was a couple of years ago. All right. Flickr. Oh, go ahead. Ken. I used it for a meeting yesterday. It is getting better. It does not manage um, multiple people very well, but it has gotten good at um, two people and a local location. So it 
It's oh, a, that's good. You're using it on your side or you, you, someone else w who was clearly using it tried to book with you? Someone else who was booking with me um, used it and I went back and forth with the bot and found something and a location and they showed up. So it was good. Okay, so that worked. Okay, very cool. All right, uh, so Flickr, thank you, Sarge, by the way, for sharing that. Uh, Flickr is a photo storage service. Uh, Google Photos is another one, um, depending on you know how you feel about Google having all the photo data. Um, and these are places where you can store, if you need to store massive archives of photos and categorize them and tag them and search them and share them, then these are platforms that are designed to do exactly that and are going to serve your needs quite a bit better than having them just sitting on a file server or on a USB drive, you know, or on you know someone's digital camera or on their smartphone. And uh, these services will usually allow you to set up a sync so that as you take photos, they'll just automatically sync up to your Flickr account, and then you can tag them and categorize them from there. Or you can even say, you know, for all the photos I'm taking over the next hour, please put them with this tag or in this you know bucket, and then you can share that out, you know, however you want. They all integrate with all the other platforms; they're easy to upload to Instagram or Twitter or any social media platform where you'd want. The one thing I would give you for Google Photos in this instant, and, I, and if Starter can know of other services that are getting there, Google search algorithms for photos have gotten remarkably good. And that could be, a huge, if you have a huge photo library and you want to be able to search for, like, I want a picture of Ken's face that it also has a cat somewhere in the photo. Um, it's, it's not tagged, it's not labeled, it's just, you know, image 69, 73, 46, 97. Um, but if I showed a picture of Ken's face and then say I want this face and a cat in some photo, Google Photos can do that pretty easily at this point. And it will pull all the photos that have Ken and a cat in it and can get more complex. So I want, you know, a sailboat and a cat or I want a lake and, you know, something green or, you know, all those things. So if that's a functionality that would be meaningful to you for a large archive of photos, then I would push you toward Google Photos just because their search is, is quite a bit better than Flickr's on that. But uh, Sart, Ken, do you guys have any caveats or any disagreements there or some other service you want to mention? So I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of Flickr for this, and I'm also a big fan of, of like, you, well, when folks are putting up photos to create a taxonomy and not rely on the AI, um, because I think the taxonomy helps organizations really have conversations about data, about what do we call our executive director? Do we call them executive director or do we call them Jim or whatever? And, and I'm a big fan of Flickr for that, for the tags, because when people do tend to upload it, it is the example you cited, Josh, that it's like, oh, everything just has a file name and someone's job is to scroll through endless photos to find that one picture that might meet the needs. Um, the other thing with Google Photos is that in our experience, when we're doing our deprovisioning as a G Suite shop, there isn't a smooth deprovisioning part for um, YouTube or for Google Photos. So we're not encouraging staff to use that at this point in time. Gotcha, okay. Oh, that's a yeah. really good point, by the way. Thank and you. I think my, my tip here is also um, whether you're using it for um, storage or for client um, outreach or marketing in some way, um, because Instagram, terrible for archiving, but dependent on your audience, that's where a lot of users are. So can, consider really the use case around it. Uh, there was also a question about, um, uh, will the presentation be available online? Yes, we will have an archived copy of this. We'll also uh, grab the slides and add those up um, to that link. It should be up within a day or two on our YouTube channel, and I will drop a link to our YouTube channel in the chat. Okay, and I am going to officially accelerate now because I realize I am I am running long because I'm I'm windy. So uh, Ken, sorry, I apologize. We're gonna we're gonna pick up the pace a little bit, and uh, and sorry if there are questions coming in, feel free to interrupt me because I'm I'm concerned we won't have a ton of Q and A time, but I will uh, hustle through here. All right, so the the next one is data visualization and creating important uh, you know charts, graphs, visualizations to help either with fundraising, with grants, with, uh, you know, campaigns, with different advocacy, anything that you might, you know, want to be able to present data in a compelling way. Tableau is pretty much the, the you know, class of the field here. Uh, there's another thing called Infogram, which you can use. 
And uh, Tableau, which can be a bit difficult, you know, in terms of the beginning, they have a service core which can connect on profits with volunteers who work at Tableau who can help get you started on virtualization. I've, I've helped organizations with a few of those chart uh, uh, projects, and that's actually been incredibly helpful. And that's a, a very helpful kind of tool in your toolkit. Uh, another free tool is Google Translate, and Google can translate your website to different languages. So if you do need to do translations and don't have access to a professional translator, then Google Translate can do a pretty decent and increasingly good job at doing translation for you. And yeah, Ken and, and on start, the oh, go ahead. Side, um, we will have uh, some webinars with on language access specifically. Um, there are two of those coming up in September, September 19th and 26th. Um, on the translate side, the best practice that's currently being recommended is um, to look at that as an initial translation and then run it by um, a professional um, for that higher um, for review, but kind of as a starting block. Um, but we have two full webinars on that topic, and I know it's a hot topic in this community. Yeah, and the only thing that I would add to what Sart just inserted was um, let people know that it's machine translation when it is machine translation, because I think there's also the brand equity that that suffers as someone who does. Um, translations, it is, uh, I think, very important for the consumer to know what the quality of, of the translation is and who's responsible for that. So let people know if you're doing machine translation, that it's machine translation. Awesome. Thank you both. Uh, this is sort of weirdly placed, but document management system. Uh, and so this is a bit beyond what you know, Google Drive or, or Dropbox and, and document management systems used to be something that were extremely common in the legal services and, and may in fact still be um, in terms of providing controls for checking documents in, checking them out, knowing their, their history. But cloud file sharing actually provides a lot of those functions. So the tools like Google Drive, Dropbox, Box.org can often do a lot of stuff. But if you need a more robust document management system that's specific to a legal services perspective, OWL is something that you can look at. It is, again, free as in puppies, uh, which we will take some, some love and, and savvy to set up. And, and Sart and Ken, I'm going to stop on each slide sort of checking in with you guys just to keep hustling through, but feel 100% free to interrupt me as I continue through. Dictation software, Google Docs, has a dictation feature built into it. There's a little microphone you can just click. Most smartphones these days have dictation programs built into them where you can just record and it'll capture your voice to varying degrees of accuracy. The traditional sort of best in class here is Dragon Systems, uh, naturally speaking, which is, you know, does cost money, but is a, a slightly more professional version of these. But the Google Docs is, actually can work pretty well, and you're welcome to experiment with that if you want to dictate. And, and if you're using Dialpad, you can also just try calling you know, into your own Dialpad and, and dictating that way using their voice transcription, which <laughs> I've actually done recently, which works pretty cool. If you need to do event registration, uh, brown paper tickets is a very inexpensive way to start uh, taking event registrations. It's free for free events, and they charge a percentage of the ticket price if you use it for paid events. And then, of course, there's Eventbrite and lots of other platforms that, that people are probably familiar with, but Brown Paper Tickets is a free one if you're just doing free events and don't, don't want to pay for another ticket registration service. Ticket Peak is a, another one that you can use that, again, is, is I, I don't know the pricing on this one, um, and I don't have it open. So I, I believe this is also a, a free uh, ticketing service for free events and then charge the percentage if, uh, if you have other ones. So Ticket Peak is another one you can use. And with that, we're going to jump into communications and fundraising. And again, I'll just remind people, if you do have questions, please get those questions in. Uh, I'm not sure how much Q&A time we'll have at the end, but I'll, I'll you know, let Sart interrupt me uh, for questions that he thinks are important to get to. The pretty much tool that everybody hopefully is familiar with, Google Analytics. If you have a website, which I presume you do, Google Analytics can give you all sorts of information about what's happening on that website, who's visiting, how long they're staying, what's their bounce rate, meaning how you know quickly do they leave your site after coming to it, uh, what kind of path do they take to your site, what pages get the most clicks, get the most traffic, what kind of browsers are people using, what are the demographics, you know, all the information you might want to know 
um, about your website visitors comes with Google Analytics. This is you know Google's kind of bread and butter, so to speak. And there's tons of actionable information here. And this is something that I think seems very complex to a lot of folks, but there are some really good low cost and free courses on Google Analytics. Uh, Whole Whale is one that I recommend, wholewhale.com. They have uh, Udemy courses uh, that you can take for you know 10 bucks, 20 bucks, or you can probably find a free pass if you go to their website. Um, I'll, I'll put uh, that in. And there's lots of other uh, nonprofits and for-profits that provide uh, courses on Google Analytics and how to learn to use that. But it is, does not require programming. It's you know probably a bit more complex than you know Zapier or FTTT, which we talked about before in terms of learning how to use it. But it is definitely learnable for non-programmers, non-developers, uh, and incredibly powerful, powerful tool for learning about the communications of your organization. If you need to send out broadcast emails, MailChimp is a great place to start. Other tools in the space are AWeber, Constant Contact, Vertical Response, uh, Salesforce Marketing Cloud, you know, it's, uh, it's increasingly in there. But MailChimp, I would say, is the kind of gold standard default choice for many organizations. Free for up to 2,000 subscribers and 12,000 emails a month, and then very, very low cost after. Gives you wonderful data on your click-through rates, on your open rates, on your bounce rates, all that good stuff that you definitely want to know if you're sending a broadcast or campaign email. So really quickly, for as an alternative yeah. to MailChimp, I'd really suggest folks have a look at Action Network. I've put some resources into the chat. I don't know if those are being shared out with everyone, but um, Action Network is a really good alternative to MailChimp. The reason why is you're having access to an entire tool set for this type of thing, as opposed to just uh, um, a one-off piece that you're going to cobble together with other things. Okay, and start just pasted that, uh, that that link there for Action Network, and then also for, for Whole Whale if you want to learn about Google, Google Analytics. Thank you so much. All right, and uh, Sarp made the note, based in Europe is, uh, is oh, an alternative event ticket service. is TI.TO, uh, which is based in Europe, so better data stewardship with GDPR and all that good stuff. Thank you, Sarp, excellent. If you need to take surveys, uh, SurveyMonkey is free for, for basic surveys. Uh, if you're a G Suite organization, or even if you're not, you can also use Google Forms, which uh, also work very, very well, and that can allow you to create surveys share them out with people, gather information. Uh, I use them all the time for projects to sort of get, you know, around change management, to find out, you know, where staff attitudes toward different things we're thinking of doing, what products do they like, you know, where to things like that. So it allows you to do very quick polls and surveys, get all the data on those the surveys and, and very terrific, very easy to use. Anybody can use SurveyMonkey, anybody can use Google Forms. And uh, they're incredibly uh, useful tools. Google Grants, online advertising, Every 501c3 nonprofit is eligible for up to 10,000 or potentially more dollars of, of Google AdWords grants through the Google Grants program. Uh, this is a bit more complex to manage and Google puts a little pressure on you, which is that you have to actually use up a fair amount of your AdWords budget. That, that, you know, if they give you a $10,000 grant, you only use $7 for six months in a row, you will wind up losing your grant. So you may want to get some help as to how to leverage that grant before you apply for it. Make sure you have a plan in place. But that is an incredibly uh, powerful donation that you can get. And again, you know, Whole Whale and a lot of other organizations provide services to actually help organizations leverage their AdWords grants to make sure not only that they don't lose them, but that they get, you know, true value out of them. And an example here is TechSoup and TechImpact.org you know, who are nonprofits using their AdWords grants to place ads when someone does a search for nonprofit technology. So that's when you, you know, do a search, those things that show up at the top, those are, those are AdWords placements. So you, they're, they're paying money to get that to show up there, and Google Grants will donate you up $10,000 a month to, to get your stuff to show up there. Foundation Directory Online, the Foundation Center offers a free online tool that helps you find the right funder for your next big project. And it costs, I forget what the pricing is for that. It is a few hundred dollars a year in order to have access to that. But you know, if you get one grant, that's obviously gonna pay for itself very, very quickly. And that's a nice resource that you can have for program support. Razoo for friend to friend or peer to peer fundraising. 
and you can definitely, you know, get your staff and get other supporters to fundraise from friends and family. Uh, other, you know, platforms here, Fundrise, Kickstarter, um, Ken and Sarp might be able to name a few others, but there are other platforms sort of in this space where you can do uh, crowdsourced fundraising or, you know, um, crowdfunding, so to speak, uh, or peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. I'm, I'm not super conversant with what all the terms that they use here. Uh, but Ken or Sarp, do you have anything you want to, any other resources you want to throw in there? Not for fundraising. Okay. I, I, I have seen some people have some luck using um, Facebook uh, with regards to particular things that are going on in their life. I haven't seen it used with regards to um, uh, legal services, but definitely other areas. So I'm, I'm curious to see how that goes overall, not from an organizational perspective, but from an individual person perspective. So. Yep, yep, absolutely. For social media management, and by this we mean you've got your Twitter feed, you've got your Facebook feed or your Facebook page for your organization, you've got your Instagram feed for your organization, and you want to manage updates and posts across all these different platforms, and there are a variety of tools out there that will allow you to manage all those from one dashboard, so you can schedule all your posts, you can set up different posts for different platforms, figure out which ones just go to all platforms, which ones get tweaked or only to specific platforms. Hootsuite is, again, the gold standard here, and there's a handful of other ones as well, but, but Hootsuite's probably the, the, the most common one, and that is free for basic use, and then it's fairly low cost if you uh, exceed what their, their basic use uh, is for, for Hootsuite. And here's one that I talk about a lot, and there's also Upwork as well. If you do want some additional expertise that is specific, so you want a graphic designer, but you only need you know one logo created, or you just need a little bit of help with a Salesforce query, or you just you know you have some kind of random development need or design need, then there are these crowdsourced platforms where you can search and hire freelancers to perform specific tasks or projects for you. And this requires a bit of project management skills and a bit of common sense in terms of vetting candidates and deciding what your price point is. You know, if you just go for the lowest price, you know, you're probably not gonna get the highest quality folks and, and there's a variety of ways you can do this. But these are really phenomenal resources because this gives you access to the entire world of freelancers and developers and designers who can perform specific tasks and, or, or be a resource on projects for you. So Fiverr is one. Fiverr tends to be like the really low cost, you know, just get it done kind of stuff. Upwork is just a little bit more upscale. 99designs is specifically around design projects, so logos, websites, book covers, and then Taproot Plus and Catchify, I'm in the orange rectangle here, if people are wondering where I'm getting all these, are both pro bono platforms Catchfire costs $200 a month, and then you can do up to three projects at a time, and Taproot Plus is completely free, but you can post a project to either of those and uh, be able to get some pro bono resources on a particular project. If you need to do photo editing, GIMP is a free uh, photo editor. Pixlr is another free one. Paint, uh, obviously, is, a, is another one out there, and then these are all you know, free alternatives to the gold standard in this space, which is, of course, Photoshop. A tool that I really love and recommend if you haven't tried it out is Canva, and they actually do have a nonprofit donation program, which I just learned about in preparing for this webinar today. So if you go to canva.com slash nonprofit, you can apply for their nonprofit, which actually gives you their paid version, kind of their basic paid version, free, which allows you to have multiple people within your organization to save different designs, gives you access to a different library of designs. And Canva allows you to create all kinds of different um, quick little, you know, if you're, you know, you need to get an email out, you need to get an Instagram post out, you need to get a postcard. It allows you to design all these things. They have all these templates, super easy to use. Uh, you know, it's still graphic designers are good at what they do because they understand what looks good and what doesn't. I don't. So even though Canva is super easy for me to use, I'm still perfectly capable of making something very ugly in it because I'm not a graphic designer and I don't have a great eye, but the tool is incredibly easy. So right. just adding up all, Canva. oh, go ahead. 
Yeah, super yeah. quickly on Canva. Enrolling in the nonprofit program is painless. We've been in that program for about three years now. The nice thing is that people become part of the team, so there's nothing lost. And the other thing is that it's a really great way to get your comms team or branding team to declare a style sheet because Canva makes it easy to say like, oh, here are the colors, here are the fonts, here are the logos. Sign up for Canva, painless and good. Awesome. And if any of you, I say, didn't know about Canva before this, and, and I, and that's, I, I can't believe it's been out there three years and I didn't know that can. Um, I, I'm embarrassed now, but it is, it is terrific. So that, that, that alone from this uh, webinar today is probably uh, worth price submission. All right, adding up costs. And I talked about this a little bit before, so you kind of go through it here. Thinking about tools as an investment, how much additional time if you save? So a 10-person organization, if, if through a combination of these tools and through improved infrastructure and all these things, we save just 10 minutes a day for 10 people. And if we go back to my, you know, $25 an hour, right, for 10 staff, that would equate to $11,500 a year in increased productivity at that 25, just 10 minutes a day. And again, that's just taking into account the not having to reboot the computer, not having to try to find that file on the file server, not having to restyle the entire program that you know someone put together because we didn't have a style guide in Canva. Um, you know, all the things that could be fixed through a lot of these free and low-cost tools that could save people time, make them more effective. You know, getting your appointment scheduled instead of having to do 9,000 emails back and forth all year. Uh, just that 10 minutes a day, 10 people. $11,500 over the course of a year. That's a lot of money and a lot of savings. But also remember, of course, that you know you, you want to test the tools and you also want to be careful of you know the, the shadow IT, meaning I've got the development part using Trello, I've got the administrative team using Asana, I've got the IT department using Basecamp, and you know, never the three shall meet, and, and now we've got three project management platforms and you know, some people on Google Voice, some people on Dialpad, some people using Canva, some, some people using, you know, some other design platform. You know, you, you do want to try to organize these things with organization. And again, think about the stack, the tech stack of your organization and make sure that you're communicating to everybody, hey, here's all the tools that we use. And if you have a particular need, then please use this tool to, to meet that need. Consider the ease of setup and kind of ongoing use, right? And, and, Salesforce is going to be a lot harder to implement than Canva. Um, you know, moving to a cloud-based file sharing system is probably going to be, you know, significantly more a larger undertaking than just starting to use a project management tool like Asana, you know, where there's nothing you're migrating from other than email and spreadsheets, which everybody's, you know, not, not working well anyway, right? So there's differences in terms of how much effort is going to be required to, to move. And I've also done lots of presentations on, just did one last month on change management. Um, and I, I won't go into a whole primer here, but understand that while we all wish it were so, you can't just say, hey everybody, we're using Asana and here's a link to all their training videos and please start using it tomorrow and expect that magically everybody's gonna be using Asana tomorrow. You have to tell people why. Why are we using Asana? <laughs> What problem are we solving for the organization and why is it, does it matter to you to start using Asana? Um, and how are you going to learn to start to use Asana? And what is it going to look like in our organization as people you know, begin to use that new tool? So why, uh, how, and what are, are very important things around, around change management. So you wanna take that very seriously. Obviously training is a part of that that's a, often a hugely overlooked part of, of a lot of these things. And we'll just jump into some more resources. TechSoup, hopefully everybody generally knows about as a resource. You've got the community core through NPower where you can have uh, volunteers to help you with different uh, projects that you have. Uh, you've got N10, which has communities of practice, which are hugely valuable. I know both Ken and myself uh, frequent many of their communities of practice to both get and give advice on and answer questions on different technology questions that people have. And of course they have trainings and conferences and things like that that are very valuable. And of course Idealware, which we've talked about. And well, we left three minutes for questions, so it wasn't too horrible. Uh, Sart, were there any questions that came in that you'd like to bring our attention to? Uh, you were up to date on the questions. 
I definitely recommend the connecting with those uh, community groups. A lot of the ideas that I've heard about here, um, I've heard about at conferences or other places. It's just a great place to share those ideas with other professionals. Um, I'm also gonna drop a link to our email, which um, group, which is a Google group. We've got about 800 legal services technologists um, on there, which range from just people who know how to use Word that have been put in charge of their budget to for an organization to individuals that are um, security experts. Like it, it is a great place to ask questions. If you've got any um, challenges in getting on the email list, also just drop me an email. I can manually add people. Um, it is a Google group. A Google email will allow you to look at the archives, but I can add anybody's email to it. And we're happy to search the archives or do research for you if there's anything that you're uh, looking for that you don't see right off. All right. Any, uh, I guess that's it. Ken, do you have any last thoughts or closing thoughts? No, I, I th well, yes and no. <laughs> I think the big one I want to stress mm -hmm. is that training slide that you put near the end, Joshua, that that is, that's really where this all is at. That when we do roll out tools, even if it is an infrastructure piece, let's make sure we talk to folks and train folks so that if we do have new document recovery software, that staff um, are familiar with using it. And um, that way we're all on the same page. The other thing I'd offer is um, when folks are talking about shadow IT, I like to look at shadow IT as the pieces where the IT unit is, um, is failing. So people are usually going to shadow IT when the IT team isn't um, proactively meeting a need. So how do we create greater communication so that IT can deliver the right tools and trainings to make this all work? Absolutely. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks for LSMTAP. Thanks to IdeaWorks. Ken, thank you a million times over. Always such a joy doing, doing training with you. Uh, thanks, Art, and uh, thanks everybody who attended. And everybody have a wonderful afternoon.